Shepherd Hill Saints, uh, tonight's Bible study is different. Uh, as I was preparing a lecture for Shield of Faith Bible College, our Bible College, as I was preparing one of the 10 lectures for my course, I taught on the important subject of the sinner's prayer. And as I listened to what God was saying through that lecture, I felt like I should share it with you, the faithful saints of our church. So tonight's Bible study is going to be different. It'll be me alone teaching. You'll see me in the Bible college setting talking about the sinner's prayer. I hope that you'll get all that God has for you. And please be aware, we'd love for you to enroll in Shield of Faith Bible College. This lecture tonight is one of 10 powerful teachings that are going to help you know what we believe and why we believe it. God bless you as you enjoy Bible study. Well, God bless you. Well, welcome to um, our class. Uh, we are in lection, lecture number five out of 10. And today we're going to talk about some very, very important, crucial things that God wants to show us. So glad that you're a part, glad that you're continuing to uh, read your textbook, Restoration of the New Testament Church. Restoration of the New Testament Church. Please read two chapters each week. You'll come to the end of the book. There will be an examination based on the book, but also very much based on the material that we're studying in our lectures, all right? So I will prepare you uh, carefully for your examinations that will uh, give you complete credit for this course. Now, as always, we begin with prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Our Father, we thank you and praise you <clears throat> for this opportunity to learn. We thank you for opening the word of life to us. Help us, Lord, to uh, build carefully on the foundation and to contend for the faith which was once delivered to, uh, to the saints. And so now, Lord, bless us. Open our understanding as we explore your word on this occasion. Bless every student. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, I want to ask you to go again to our uh, base scripture of Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38, where Peter has so beautifully laid out the pattern. The pattern. We've talked in this class so often about the pattern. We started this entire course by quoting God as he spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter number 25. And he said, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you in the mount. And so we say then that as we seek to restore the church, we are seeking to restore it to the pattern of the apostles. We are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. So in the first Christian service, in the first altar call, Simon Peter gave a pattern. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, I will always remind you of that uh, important verse. Verse number 38, beginning at verse 37, when they heard the first sermon, they were pricked in their heart. They said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse number 38, then Peter said unto them, Repent, number one, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, that's number two, for the remission of sins, and then number three, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The promise is to you and to your children, to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Peter was saying to them, We received the Holy Ghost today, the 120 of us in the upper room, now that same promise of God is to you, it is to your children, it is to all who are far away from us, whether they are geographically far or whether they are chronologically far down into the 21st century, the promise of the Holy Ghost is still the valid promise of God upon which you uh, may rely. Now today we are talking about the sinner's prayer and salvation. That is the title of our lesson, The Sinner's Prayer and Salvation. There are many people today who teach that an individual is saved when they pray the sinner's prayer. Now, I need you to listen carefully without prejudice, without assumptions. I need you to hear what the Word of God says uh, to make clear this question of 
the sinner's prayer. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ taught us in the uh, Gospel of John that a man must enter the kingdom of God by being born again, and specifically born of water and of the Spirit. Not water and Spirit, but water and the Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, despite the clarity of that teaching, and despite the pattern that Peter showed in Acts chapter 2, there are many today who feel that a person can enter the kingdom of God simply by praying a prayer based on the way they have interpreted Romans chapter 10. All right. So I want to say that God knows exactly what he wants and the opinions and the thoughts of man do not change what the Lord wants. So thank God for the clarity that we have in looking at this question. What is the significance of the sinner's prayer? All right. The prayer is a prayer of repentance. That is very important. Repentance is very critical. But a verbal confession of repenting does not constitute salvation. Here's what Jesus said about salvation. You remember, Saint Mark chapter 16, verse 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. So the Lord did not say, He that prays a prayer shall be saved. He did not say, He that believes and prays a prayer. But He says, He that believes and is baptized. He said, He that is born again of water and of the Spirit. All right. So salvation is described by Simon Peter and by the eleven as requiring that one must be uh, born of water and spirit. Now, uh, in researching the sinner's prayer, I encourage you to uh, do your own research if any of you are uncertain. Many times um, there are various crusades uh, around the world, around America, first of all, and then around the world. And a preacher will stand and preach. When he's finished preaching, he will say, Now, if you believe the gospel, I want you to come to the altar, come down to the front, and repeat these words after me. And then they will pray uh, what is called the sinner's prayer. Oh, Lord, uh, I know I am a sinner. Uh, there are many different ways uh, that one might pray it. And as I look at my notes, here are some of the things Billy Graham used to have them say. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins. I invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In your name, amen. That's what Billy Graham used to have people say. All right, Campus Crusade for Christ. Here's the words that they use. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life. I receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins, giving me eternal life. Take control of my life. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. All right, that's how Campus Crusade prayed it. Here's Greg Laurie's version of the sinner's prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I believe you died for my sins right now. I turn from my sins. I open the door of my heart and life. I confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Amen. And on and on and on. So these are various ways that people have had believers, new uh, believers, to say the sinner's prayer, and then they feel that that makes that person saved. I have to tell you that according to the New Testament pattern, that is absolutely and 100% wrong. That is not the way of salvation. Now, some people read Romans chapter 10, and uh, they read it. I'm going to read that scripture because that is the scripture that uh, sometimes is read to justify the sinner's prayer. But I want you to know the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. The sinner's prayer wasn't done when the apostles walked the earth. The sinner's prayer didn't happen in the second century, the third century, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, all the way through the Middle Ages, the year 1000, there was no sinner's prayer. The year 1500, 
there was no sinner's prayer. It is believed that the sinner's prayer might have begun in the 17th century, and certainly there seems to be evidence of it in the 18th century, and then it really, many people believe, the sinner's prayer only really emerged in the 20th century. Now, I've done all the research on that. I, I am not going to take you through history tonight because I want to show you what the Word says. But what I am saying to you is that the sinner's prayer is not the New Testament pattern of salvation. And I also will say to you categorically, the sinner's prayer does not bring a person to salvation. Now, why may I make that bold statement? Because we see in the Word what the apostles did and what they taught. Peter, James, John, Paul, they did not teach the sinner's prayer as a means of being reconciled to God. It is only a man-made tradition. Now, I love the church. I love the brethren. Many people who do it that way, they are sincere, but sincerity doesn't mean that it is biblical or true. A man must be born again. Now, let me say this to you clearly, dear students. If a person says the sinner's prayer, in a sense, there's no damage done unless they falsely believe that they are now saved. If one recites the sinner's prayer as a means of repenting, and if they mean it from the heart, that can be a good step toward repentance. But repentance is not verbal. Repentance is behavioral. Repentance is a turning from the old, ugly, sinful lifestyle. Repentance is not words. Repentance is deeds and behavior. Repentance is not what I feel. Repentance is what I do. I metanoia. It is metanoia, the noun. Metanoia, the verb. I turn. That is repentance. If I pray a prayer that says I am repenting, even though I pray the prayer, the prayer is not repentance. My behavior will show whether I have repented or not. What does that mean? Simple concept. If I used to lie, I have to stop. If I used to cuss and use foul language and live in a hostile mindset, I have to stop. If I lived in immorality, I have to stop. That is repentance. Repent and then be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit because it is by one spirit that we are baptized into the body, not by the words of the mouth. Jesus said, the people honor me with their lips. That means their language. But their heart has not repented and their heart has not been changed by the Spirit of God. All right. So, uh, the sinner's prayer, uh, many people I believe it only started uh, with men like Billy Sunday and Dwight L. Moody and Billy Graham and many others. It is now very, very prevalent. It is very popular and uh, many have misread Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9 where the scripture says, If thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God uh, raise him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And the word of God says uh, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But this passage of scripture is not showing how a person becomes a Christian. That is not what it's showing. It is talking about a lifestyle. The primary focus of Romans chapter 10, watch what I'm going to say, this is life-changing, is not how to be saved, but who can be saved. Not how to be saved, but who can be saved. I'll say it again the third time. It is not telling how to be saved, it is telling who can be saved. Paul is talking in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 about Jews and Gentiles. He's talking about Israel and those who are not physical Israel. He is saying that the same Lord over all is rich or merciful to all that call on him. For whosoever shall confess 
the, the Lord shall be saved. All right. That's what Paul is dealing with in Romans chapter 10. Again, I want to be clear. He says in verse number uh, 12, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How are they going to hear how they're going to call the name without a preacher? So he is showing who can call on the name of the Lord. Now, when he says call on the name of the Lord, dear student, that doesn't mean the sinner's prayer. That means I'm to call on him on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I call on him in January, February, March, April, May. I call on him in 1970, 1980, 1990, the year 2000. To call on the name of the Lord is a lifestyle of worship and prayer. It is not a one-time event at the altar. It is not something that you do at a Billy Graham crusade and that saves you. That is not what the scripture is talking about. It is talking about a lifetime of seeking God, a lifetime of praying. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint. That is, we always, you know, pray without ceasing. That means calling on the name of the Lord every day for years. I was baptized in 1953, all right, almost 70 years ago. And I've been calling on the name of the Lord day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and I am still calling on the name of the Lord. And if I stop calling on the name of the Lord, even at this advanced age, I would surely fall away from faith and go back into the world. So when the scripture says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Dear students, that's talking about a lifestyle, not a one-time superficial encounter in an arena somewhere, in a crowd of 50,000 people standing before a platform. That's not what calling upon the name of the Lord means. In order to be saved, it is more than lip service. It is more than a verbal statement. One must be born again of water and of the Spirit, unless Jesus was wrong in what he told Nicodemus. He said, except a man is born again of the water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Simon Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Jesus wasn't wrong. Peter wasn't wrong. And Billy Graham right. No, Billy Graham was wrong. Jesus was right. Peter was right. Many pastors today are wrong. Because when they preach a message, when it is over, they ask, now, if you've not been born again, stand. And then they have you stand up and they say, all right, be brave. Come on down to the altar. And then when they get you to the altar, then they say, repeat these words after me. Oh, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And again, I can read to you the words that are commonly said. All right. Oh, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I know that you are holy. And now save me. And now you are saved says the pastor who doesn't understand it himself. But where's the water in that? Where is the Holy Spirit in that? Where's the genuine repentance in that? Now, you should be aware, dear students, that in many cases, after they pray the sinner's prayer, yes, they will invite them to come back and to be baptized. And yes, they will encourage them, many of them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, many of them will say, that receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not necessary. They will tell you falsely that the moment you called on the name of the Lord, the Holy Spirit came over you, and now you have the Holy Spirit. That is not true. That is not biblical. That is not the New Testament pattern. We're going to show you that in the course of this class. I'm saying to you, dear students, much of the church today is out of order. And I will also say to you with love and also with great heaviness that many people who think that they are saved today are not yet saved. Now, the word of God made that clear because Paul told us that in writing to his son, Timothy. He said in the last days that they're going to have a form of godliness, 
but denying the power thereof. They will have religious Christian churchy activities, but the power of God will not be there as it was not in Acts chapter 19 when Paul went down to the city of Ephesus and he found worshipers there and he saw the power of God wasn't there. And he asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said to Paul, we have never even heard of anything called the Holy Ghost. What do you mean, holy what? What are you saying to us? And then Paul explained to them the true gospel of Jesus Christ. This is Acts chapter 19. I think you know your Bible. And he says there, when, when he did that, when they heard that about Jesus, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Paul laid his hands on them, and they spake with tongues, and they prophesied. So they received water and spirit baptism. All right. But those who believe in the sinner's prayer for salvation, they do not encourage or necessarily insist on water baptism and spirit baptism. So now what I want you to do, dear ones, get your Bible. This is very important. And this is, I'm going, I'm going more slowly in this lecture, I think, than other times, because this lesson is so critical. I would submit to you that this may be the greatest single corruption in present Christian practice. This idea of having individuals pray a prayer and then telling them that you are now saved. That is not the pattern. You cannot find not one instance of that practice in the book of Acts. Go to Romans chapter 10. I remind you what we said. The book of Acts is a history book. It is designed to show the saints, to show believers how the early church behaved. What did they do? All right, we can read the entire book of Acts from chapter 1, chapter 2, where they received the Holy Ghost, and then on to chapter 28, when we finish with the ministry of Paul. And never in one instance do we find them, the disciples, leading sinners in what is called the sinner's prayer. The closest thing you find to that is when Philip meets the eunuch in the desert. And Philip says, if you believe, you can be baptized. And the sinner said, I believe. The, the, the Ethiopian eunuch said that. And then uh, what did he do? Well, then Philip didn't say, well, now you're saved. He took him down into the water. Both of them went into the water. And Philip baptized the eunuch. All right. But in the book of Acts, dear students, hear me repeat it again. There is no instance whatsoever where the disciples lead anyone in the process called the sinner's prayer. It is conspicuously absent. It is clearly, documentably absent. It is glaringly absent. If it were the way of salvation, I believe in all my heart that the Lord would have put it in the pattern book, the book of Acts. It is not there because it is not biblical salvation. All right. Uh, Romans chapter 10. Look carefully uh, with me, dear ones. All right, and I'm going to unpack Romans chapter 10 very carefully. All right, so what Paul is saying in verse number one is that my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, Paul, in his early uh, missionary work, he had gone out preaching to the Jews, but the Jews were so resistant to the gospel. And the Lord Jesus had told the disciples, if you go to a city and you preach and they reject the gospel, then uh, shake the dust off of your feet and go on and preach to someone else. All right. And so Paul then, he began to preach very often to Gentiles and many Gentiles were saved. But Paul says here, stay with me now in Romans chapter 10, he said, my heart's desire and my prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. He said, I know that they have a zeal for God, but they are not knowledgeable. They don't know what they're talking about. He says in verse two, they are not according to knowledge. In verse three, he says they are ignorant of God's righteousness and they're trying to uh, operate in their own righteousness. And by trying to do it their way, they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. 
All right. Verse number four, it says, Jesus Christ is the fulfilling of the law to everyone that believes. And he says in verse number five that Moses describes the righteousness of the law, that if a man could do all of that, he could be saved by the law under the old covenant. But verse number six, the righteousness, which is a faith now, Paul says, the righteousness that we have in Jesus, the new covenant, is not that difficult, Paul says. Stay with me now. This is very important. He said it's not that difficult. Don't say who's going to ascend up to heaven to bring the Messiah down. Or who's going to go down into the ocean to bring uh, the Messiah up from the dead. He said it's not that hard to be saved, says Paul. All right. But what say it then? The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. It's the word of faith. He said, it's so easy to be saved in the New Testament times. He said, if you will confess that you believe in Jesus and believe that God raised him from the dead, that's your beginning toward salvation. You can be saved if you believe it in here and are willing to stand up for Jesus as you go throughout the world. That's what it means to confess with your mouth. That means that, means that you are, uh, you, you're, you're not ashamed, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. You go around and you tell people, I'm a believer. You accept the stigma of the cross. Amen. You accept the rejection of the world. The world will hate you. That, that's what it means to confess Jesus. It means that you are a bold, unashamed believer. It doesn't mean I'm just, I'm just standing at an altar surrounded by a, a hundred thousand other believers. That doesn't take any courage to stand at the altar and say, Lord, I know you're the Savior. That doesn't take any courage. All right. But what Paul is talking about He's saying, if you'll live a courageous, committed life and go through your life telling people that you're saved, he said, you just have to identify with your salvation. You have to stand up before the world. It's not how you get saved, but it's the lifestyle that you live. So we are confessing Jesus every day. When we go to the supermarket, we, we bless people and we say, you know, God bless you. Yes, I'm a believer. Yes, I go to church. Yes, I love Jesus. Yes, I've been born again of the water and of the spirit. That's confessing Jesus with my mouth. That doesn't just mean to say, Lord, I believe that you're a savior. That's not, that's not, I mean, that's a fine thing to do, but that's not how you receive salvation. So he is saying, if you'll stand up for Jesus, if you'll identify openly with what it means to be saved and separate yourself from the world, all right, with the heart we believe uh, uh, to righteousness, with the mouth we stand up for our salvation, we acknowledge our salvation, all right? He shifts then to say in verse 11, the scripture says that whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. That's what Paul is talking about. Confessing with your mouth and so forth, it has to do with with being a bold, public believer. All right, what did Simon Peter do uh, on the night Jesus was arrested? He denied him three times. The Lord said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. If you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you when the judgment comes. So what Paul is saying about confessing with your mouth and so forth means you simply are publicly open about being a tongue talker. You're publicly open about being a passionate worshiper, being a Jesus enthusiast. Paul talks about being a fool for Christ. That's what he's talking about. But he means confessing with your mouth and being committed in your heart. It is a lifestyle of open, committed, public Christianity. All right. And the scripture goes on to say that with, uh, the scripture says, whosoever believes on him shall be saved. There's no difference then between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over all the Jews and the Gentiles is rich unto all the Jews and the Gentiles. And whoever, whether Jewish or Gentile, calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever continues seeking God, as I've been doing since I got baptized in 1953, Dwight Eisenhower was a president. And that's when I began calling on the name of the Lord. All right. And I, I was baptized in water. And then in 1959, the Lord baptized me with the Holy Spirit. I've been born again. And it's salvation. It's New Testament salvation according to the pattern. So let me go into other scripture. I hope we've made that clear, dear students. All right. So uh, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 2, talking about oral confession. All right. Jesus said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many of the people, listen, listen to what I'm going to say now. Many of those who teach the sinner's prayer for salvation, they also teach eternal security. And Jesus, Jesus defeats both of those lying concepts in one verse. He says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But those that do the will of my Father, those that live, those that are really born again and then live a holy life, no eternal security. I've got to do the will of my Father. I've got to flee fornication. We've got to lie not one to another. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness, which is lying. Thou shalt have no other God. So we must do the will of the Father. We must be born again, genuinely, and then we must live a holy life. Oh, dear students, there's so much to correct in the Christian community. There's so much to restore. There's such radical deviation from the New Testament pattern. The church must be revived and come back to a biblical basis. And, and set aside the traditions of men and stand firmly in the New Testament pattern. Word of God said, Jude said, uh, hope, earnestly contend for the faith. And Paul said, be steadfast and unmovable. All right. It is Matthew uh, uh, 15 and 8 where Jesus said, the people draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips. But their heart is not born again. And even Billy Graham himself, later in his life, he said, I, I wonder if hardly any of those people that came to the altar uh, ever got saved. And the, the, the studies by George Barna and others show that so many people that came to the altar and prayed that prayer, the huge percentage of them never committed their life to Christ. They never joined a church. Many of them were never baptized in the water. The huge percentage of them never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Many of them were not transformed. They just said some words. Oh, this is a serious problem. Jesus said, they, they, they honor me. They draw nigh with their mouth and they honor me with their lips. Jesus is talking about exactly what happens at many of these major crusades. They'll, have a, they'll do it on television. They'll say, if you want to be born again, call this number, and their counselor's waiting for you, and then you call the number, and then they'll lead you in what they call the sinner's prayer, and then they'll repeat these words after me, and now you are saved. Hallelujah. Praise God, you're saved. Now you have eternal life. God bless you, brother. Welcome to the body of Christ. And then they'll report on television. Tonight we had 724 people that were born again, gave their life to the Lord. But according to Jesus, none of those people were born again because you must be born of water and of the Spirit. Luke chapter 6 and verse number 46, Jesus, again, all these times, this is Jesus talking and the things that I'm saying. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? How can you say Lord, Lord, and you won't be born again of water and spirit? And if, water, if, if, if what Jesus said to Nicodemus doesn't mean water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism, then I think the person is challenged to say, what does it mean? Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, some people say, well, that doesn't mean water baptism. It doesn't mean Holy Ghost baptism. Well, then the, the, it becomes the burden of, of, of explanation becomes on that skeptic. What does it mean then? If water and spirit doesn't mean what Peter said at Pentecost, then what does it mean? What was Jesus talking about? Well, somebody said, well, he meant the water of the word. He meant the water of the birth canal, the, the amniotic fluid of the mother. You got to be born out of the water of the mother, and then you have to be born again by God's influence. Come well. One could say all of that, but none of that squares with the pattern. When we look at the pattern in the book of Acts, the history book of the church, we see the apostles going around baptizing people in water, getting them baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
over and over. We're going to look at all the instances, and we're going to look at some of those even here tonight in the next few minutes. All right. So here are some of the, here are some of the examples. Let's look at the pattern now of what they did in the book of Acts. I'm going to take you through the conversions that are in the book of Acts. I see 25 of them. Perhaps my time will allow us to go through each of them. All right. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse number 4, there, uh, 41, they that glad to receive his word were baptized. So that's how people were brought into the church in uh, the book of Acts. They were baptized. All right. Now, in verse chapter number 4, uh, verse 4, it said, many heard the word and believed. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 14, it says, believers were added to the Lord. In Acts chapter 6, verse 7, it said, uh, the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. In Acts chapter 5, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 8, verse 12, it said, when they believed Philip, they were baptized. It didn't say when they believed Philip, they prayed the sinner's prayer. Because that sinner's prayer doesn't even show up in history until about the 17th, 17th or 18th century. And many people believe the sinner's prayer that you really can't find it historically until you come down to the late 19th century with uh, uh, an early, uh, even uh, 20th century with Billy Sunday and Dwight uh, Moody and those uh, guys that were doing mass evangelism. There are many people who say you can't even find uh, the sinner's prayer at all in history until you come all the way up into the 20th century or the last part of the 19th century. All right? So... Uh, so that, that's what we see. Uh, but I'll let you do your own study. And I would invite every one of you students to, to go to your study sources, whether you someplace on the Internet, wherever you want to go, uh, and look at uh, the question of the sinner's prayer. I encourage you, I, I, I welcome you to look it up and look up the, type in, dear student, the history of the sinner's prayer. Or you can put it in this way. Where did the sinner's prayer come from? What is the origin of the sinner's prayer? And you will see that it is non-existent in the days when the church was established. It is non-existent down through the hundreds and even 2,000 years. It isn't even there. It's only a modern creation. And it isn't valid for the salvation of souls. Go to Acts chapter 8 for a moment, dear students. And let's dig in carefully. And I, it's going to slow us down a bit. But we'll finish everything in the time allotted. Acts chapter 8 shows us the saints of God were chased out of Jerusalem because of persecution. They didn't want to stay and be killed as Stephen had just been martyred. So they left Jerusalem. And the word of God said in verse number 4, chapter 8, verse 4, they that were scattered abroad, they went everywhere preaching the word. All right. Now verse number 5 tells us Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ under them and the people believed all right and they had they saw miracles demons were cast out the sick were healed there was great joy in the city all right we want to look specifically at verse number verse number 12 it said all right look at verse 12 now Acts chapter 8 and verse 12 I hope you have your Bible it says here when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. When they believed, it did not say that they prayed the sinner's prayer. And it did not say that Philip led them in a sinner's prayer. He cast out devils. He preached the gospel. People were healed. And when they believed it, they were baptized. They were born again of the water. And then they sent for Peter and John. And they prayed for them, amen, so they could be born of the Spirit. Now watch it now. Look at this. Look, this is what I'm saying. Verse number 14. Acts chapter 8, verse 14. When the apostles at Jerusalem heard Samaria receive the word, they sent Peter and John to them. And when they came down, in verse 15, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Why? Verse 16. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. They laid their hands on them. 
and they received the Holy Ghost. Now listen, look at what happened in Samaria. They heard the preaching. They saw the miracles. They believed. And when they believed, they were water baptized. That's what Jesus said they had to do. And then they did not have the Holy Ghost yet because contrary to what many teach, the Holy Ghost doesn't come on you just because you believe. It doesn't come on. See, even, even uh, at the day of Pentecost, the, the convicted sinners said, we, what must we do? They were clearly believers, but they didn't have the Holy Ghost yet. They believed Simon Peter's preaching at Pentecost. That's why they said, what do we do? Peter, we believe what you said. We believe Jesus was God. We believe Jesus was Messiah. We believe that he died for our sins and rose again. We believe that, but we still don't have what we need. And so Peter said, here's what you do. You make a decision to change your life. Then you get water baptized, and then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So here they believed Philip. They were water baptized, but they needed Peter and John to come down with their specific anointing and their authority. They laid hands on them. And then in verse number 17, then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So they followed the pattern. The Samaritans followed the pattern that was established on the day of Pentecost. All right. Acts chapter 9. When Paul got saved. All right. What did he do? Amen. You know the story of Paul. I won't go into detail. He was blinded by the light of God. He went to uh, on down to Damascus and he heard what he should do. And then uh, uh, the man Ananias prayed for him and uh, he was healed. His sight came back. And then in verse number 18, he said, Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. He received his sight at forthwith, and he arose and was baptized. Paul got up from there with faith and humility. He repented, and he was baptized. He got healed, and Paul got baptized. And I know that he got baptized in the water, and I know that Paul got baptized in the Holy Spirit, because in the book of Corinthians, he said, I speak with tongues more than anybody in this church, Paul said. He was a tongue talker. Those of you that don't like tongue talkers, you wouldn't like the apostle Paul because he said, I speak in tongues more than anybody in the church. All right. Now go to chapter 10 at Cornelius house. All right. What happens here? All right. The Lord tells Simon Peter uh, what I call clean. Don't you call it unclean? So then he told Simon Peter, Go down to the house of a Gentile, Cornelius. He's an Italian guy. He's a soldier. But I accept him. I'm going to save. I'm not saving Jews only. I'm going to show you I'm saving Gentiles now. So he goes down to Cornelius' house, and Peter preaches about Jesus, and he never gets to make an invitation to be saved. He never gets to have an altar call. He never gets to say, who wants to be born again? He didn't get to say any of that. The Word of God tells us in verse number 44, while Peter was still preaching, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the Word. They all were filled with the Holy Spirit. It was just like the day of Pentecost. Verse number 46, they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now, look at that. Look at what you got there. This is not the sinner's prayer. Paul didn't, uh, Peter didn't get through preaching and then say, all right, if you want to be saved, say the sinner's prayer after me, and now you're saved. No, 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 because that's not what gets you saved, your students. All right, look at what happens here. Simon Peter, the Jewish guy, goes and he takes some other Jewish guys with him, goes to the house of a Gentile who he didn't even think could be saved, but God said, whatever I clean up, don't you dare call it unclean. All right. And so he said, well, the Lord must want me to tell him about him. So he stands up and he preaches about Jesus. And while he is preaching about Jesus, God, in his sovereignty, gives, pours out the Holy Spirit on these Gentiles, who the Jews didn't even think could be saved. They thought, surely God is not going to save these people. They're, they're like dogs. They eat pork and all this. and they, They're not circumcised. They can't be in the church. And while Peter is still preaching, the Lord pours out the Holy Ghost and the whole room, uh, Cornelius, his wife, his children, his servants, everybody, everybody starts speaking in tongues. And Peter said to the other Jews, wow, now, what are you guys going to say about this? Can any man forbid water 
that they shouldn't be water baptized. They've already been spirit baptized. God gave them the Holy Ghost. You see it. They speak it in the same tongues. He says in verse 47, they received the Holy Ghost as well as we. They got the Holy Ghost as well as we did. They were born in the Spirit as, as thoroughly as we were. The same thing that happened to us at Pentecost just happened to them. So the fact that they're Gentiles, the same Lord over all is rich to all that call on him. So then in verse number 48, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. We know who the Lord is. That's Jesus' name, not titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. All right. He commanded them to do that. So we see they were not saved by praying the sinner's prayer. No, there's no sinner's prayer in there. They're born of the water and spirit. All right. Go down to Acts chapter 16 and verse number 15. And there you see Lydia is saved. She's a very powerful woman, a wonderful leader. God uses her as a spiritual leader. Acts chapter 16 and verse number 15. In the city of Thyatira. All right. There was a, a woman, verse 14, a certain woman named Lydia. She was a businesswoman. All right. She was a powerful lady that had money, had position and influence. And uh, the Lord opened her heart. And verse number 15, when she was baptized in her household, she asked Paul, please stay in my house. I want your anointing to be around my family. All right. But what we see in verse 15 is that when she believed she was baptized, it doesn't say she prayed the sinner's prayer and said, Lord, I'm a sinner and now I'm born again. No, 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 no. Because that's not the pattern. All right. Go to Acts chapter 19. Go to chapter 16. We should get that. It's not skip. Who is that? That's the Philippian jailer. In the middle of the night, he got baptized. All right. You know the story of Acts chapter 16? Uh, Paul and, and Silas, uh, they are uh, preaching and they get thrown in jail. All right. Uh, where am I? Lord, help me to find where I want to be. Uh, Acts chapter number uh, 16. Uh, all right. A amen. Thank you. They get thrown in jail. And at midnight, they begin to sing songs and praise God. And the Lord shakes the jail open and the doors are open. And uh, the jailer comes running. He sees the doors open. He thinks everybody's gone and he's getting ready to kill himself because they would have killed him. He's getting ready to kill himself. And Paul says, don't kill yourself. All right. That's Acts chapter 16. You have your Bible. Look at it. Verse 28. Paul cried with a loud voice. Do yourself no harm. We're all here. And he came running in, and he fell down before Paul. And he said in verse number 30, What must I do to be saved? And then Paul said, Believe on the Lord, and you will be saved, and your house. And then in verse 32, watch it now. They spake unto him the word of the Lord, and all of his house. He didn't just say, Believe on the Lord, without telling him what to believe. If you believe on the Lord, listen, listen, listen. If you believe on the Lord, You've got to believe that he commands people to be born of water and spirit. You can't just believe that he's the son of Mary, that he's the son of God, that he died and rose again. That's wonderful. But you've got to believe every word that proceeds. Every word. And one of the words he said is that you must be born again of water and of how can anybody say, I believe on the Lord, but I don't want to be baptized in the water, and I don't see why I have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Anyone that says that does not believe in the Lord. But Paul told this man, if you believe on the Lord, you can be saved and your whole family will be saved. And then in verse number 32, watch it. They spake unto him the word of the Lord and to the whole house. They told them what it took to be saved. They told them what it took to be born again. And in verse number 33, he gave them first aid and then he was baptized. In verse 33, the same hour of the night, in the middle of the night, Paul did not say, now you're a believer, you know, pray the prayer, now you're saved, come back on the fourth Sunday and we'll baptize you if you feel like it. And it would be good if you get the Holy Ghost sometime, but if you don't ever get it, you know, you're still saved for eternity, you're eternally secure. Paul didn't say any of the stuff that's being said, my God, in churches today. He took that man and his, no doubt his wife and his children, said all his household. He baptized them that very night. That is the pattern. Let's go to Acts chapter 19, chapter 18. 
I don't want to go too fast. Chapter 18. All right. And we're going to look there. So what are we doing, dear students? We're looking at the pattern. This is what the apostles did. They kept baptizing people in water, getting them baptized in the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 18, all right, they come to Corinth, chapter 18, verse number 8, and they preached to them in Corinth, all right? And it says in verse 8, look there, you have your Bible, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. It didn't say not one of them prayed the sinner's prayer and said, now we are saved. But they, in Corinth, when they believed, they were baptized. All right. Lord, help us to do it right in a way that honors you. Then the last scripture we'll look at is in chapter number 19. And we talked about that when Paul came to Ephesus. And it says there uh, in verse number two, Paul said to the believers there, he said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. He said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? They said, Unto John's baptism. We were baptized following John the Baptist. Verse number four. Then Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him which would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized again. This time, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus, who is the Christ. Paul said, uh, uh, Peter said in Acts chapter 2, he is both Lord and Christ. You can call him Lord Jesus or Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ or Jesus the Lord. But he is the one who was the son of Mary and the son of God. God manifest in flesh. He died on the cross and there's no salvation in any other name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Verse number five said, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them. So they were born again. They spoke with tongues. They prophesied. They were born of the water. They were born of the Spirit. Oh, there's so much correction. In order for us to get back to the Bible, to get back to the pattern in order for the church to be restored. We said to ourselves and to one another in this class, we come to this class in humility. We come to this class like little children. We come prepared to challenge any assumptions that cannot be clearly and unmistakably backed up by the word of God. If the word doesn't say it, then I cannot let myself believe it. If it's not the pattern of the early church, it cannot be the pattern of our church life today. Jesus Christ the same. Jude said, be aware, be careful, because certain men have crept in unawares and they're trying to turn the church into a playboy club. He said, they're libertines. The Lord said in, Acts, in, in Revelation chapter 2, when he spoke to the church, I believe at Thyatira, he said, I have something against you because you suffered that woman Jezebel to teach and to teach the, the saints to commit fornication. And, 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 and John said, try the spirits, for they be of God. For many false prophets, many false prophets have gone out into the world and deceived many. And so students, as we look at restoration of the church, we have to ask ourselves, where are the false prophets today? See, many of you that are watching, you feel like everybody that calls the name of the Lord is going to be saved. I mean, if you say Jesus, you must be all right. If you're a Christian, I mean, your doctrine may be squirrely, but, you know, you must love Jesus and God sees your heart. He understands. So where, where are the doctrines of devils that Paul talked about? Where are the false prophets that James warned us of? Peter said, there'll be false teachers among you. 
even as there were false teachers among them. Where are the false teachers? We must, we must put line upon line and precept upon precept. We must rightly divide the word of truth. We must not rest the scriptures. God help us to our own destruction. And so thank you for being uh, vigilant and being discerning. Thanks for being prayerful. Thank you for being sincere. Study. Watch this lecture again. Watch it again. Watch it again. And make sure that you are hearing clearly what God is saying to you concerning the sinner's prayer and the way of true salvation. We have to speak the truth in love. We're not contentious. We're not fighting. We're not disrespectful. We will never let our attitude invalidate our message. We'll never speak the truth in a hateful way so that men cannot receive it. But we will speak biblical truth with a loving spirit because if I speak to the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, it profits me nothing. God bless you students until we come together again. We're going to keep on looking at the hard realities that we have to understand to see the church restored. God bless you.